I must tell you of a work that has moved quietly forward in the church, virtually unnoticed. The Lord could have given Joseph Smith a copy of the Book of Mormon already translated into English, but it would not have served him as well as the struggle he went through to translate it. Start with Genesis. It's in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We felt there were improvements that could be made to get the eye and the heart into the scriptures. We might be tempted to give a little bit of short shrift to the Bible. And this surely said in no uncertain terms, no, 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 these are the standard works. Every person can have the scriptures in their own tongue, in their own language. It was obvious that we were being guided. The product itself is a testimony of that. Truly, this is that promised day when every man might speak in the name of God the Lord, even the Savior of the world. In the beginning, a loving Father in heaven directed his children to convey his words one to another. From the skins of animals to tablets of stone, from metal plates to dried parchment, the words of God have been carved, etched, and inked in an effort to make them accessible to the human family. But the arduous task of copying this information by hand often left the vast majority of God's children dependent upon a select few to read, to interpret, and to expound. However, in the middle of the 15th century, Johannes Gutenberg's printing press ushered in a new era of accessibility to the Word of God. Although Gutenberg's first printed volume was the Latin Bible, to make the Bible accessible in other languages required heroic efforts and cost many lives. For instance, William Tyndale held off heretical fires long enough to give the New Testament, and much of the Old, an eloquent English tongue. Additional versions by other translators followed. By the early 17th century, in an effort to end theological conflicts, King James of England authorized a new version of the Bible. His appointed scholars published this version in 1611, based primarily upon Tyndale's efforts. Soon, Bibles were being carried by immigrants sailing to America, thus tethering their families to God. One such Bible ended up in the home of young Joseph Smith, Jr. As he thoughtfully studied pages from his family's Bible, a promise from the Apostle James touched his heart. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Acting with faith, he humbly asked for and received a glimpse of eternity. Joseph became instrumental in making additional scriptures available that, in conjunction with the King James Bible, would become the doctrinal cornerstones of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. However, the Word of God was still limited to a copy or two per household. In 1971, several forces converged to bring an LDS edition of the King James Bible into serious consideration. One such force was a new focus of the adult curriculum on the four standard works. Additionally, the primary, Sunday school, seminary, and missionary programs drew upon multiple King James Bibles as integral parts of their respective curricula. They were using different Bibles for the kids in primary, and then when they went to seminary, they had a different Bible. And when they got into the adult area, they had a different Bible. So there was three different Bibles they were using. To help church leaders decide which Bible could be used by all, a Bible survey was initiated within the General Library Committee. We gathered up all the Bibles we could find, and uh, we Xeroxed aspects of each of these Bibles and had people select, well, I like that margin width. Well, I like a concordance. Well, we ought to have maps. I think our cross-referencing in this Bible is the best, and so on. And the intent was to find a Bible that best matched what people said they wanted.
we got the results back and we uh, tried to match it up as best we could with the existing Bibles and there was not a very good match. I took it to Dan Lado, the uh, director of Church Correlation, and then after careful thought, he made a recommendation to the brethren that perhaps the time had come when the church ought to produce its own LDS edition of the King James Bible. An LDS Bible would not only help the saints better appreciate this book of Scripture, but it would give them a greater understanding of the unity of God's words across geographic and generational boundaries. There was a determination to encourage our people to study the Scripture, not just read, but to study. And in that way, the most important thing was that they could cross-reference from the Bible, to the New Testament, Old Testament, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl the Great Price, Book of Mormon. And it uh, came from curriculum, from other places, from the missionaries that uh, we needed to become more scripturally literate. And then there were some improvements we felt that could be made in the uh, chapter headings and in the introduction to each chapter and to grab the reader. The decision was made by the First Presidency in 1972 to proceed with an LDS edition of the King James Version of the Bible. The initial step was to form an advisory committee designated to oversee the project. Elder Thomas S. Monson was asked to head the committee. We had President Monson and Elder Monson. He was a printer, and he was an expert in printing. That, that's what he did for a living. So he had that pattern. Bruce McConkey was the uh, uh, expert on the doctrine, and I was somewhere in between them on the my concern was to have them printed in such a way that the ordinary man could afford them and could handle them. Page layout, the, the, the format, the style of a type, uh, that was President Monson's, one of his responsibilities. The uh, topical guide was done by a committee of men, but they worked precisely with President Packer. The footnotes and the chapter headings and uh, the JST and the dictionary we did under the direction of Elder McConkie. That was the cream of the crop and in a certain way as far as the scriptures were concerned. In the Doctrine and Covenants, first section, there's a remarkable statement that set the course of the church on a course different from all the Christian churches. And it was simply this, that, that every man might speak in the name of God, the Lord, the Savior of the world. But if every man's going to hold a priesthood and speak in the name of God, the Lord, the Savior of the world, then he needs to be scripturally literate. And that was our objective, to get the eye and the heart into the scriptures. In the fall of 1972, three Bible scholars were invited to join this magnificent undertaking aimed at assisting and improving doctrinal scholarship throughout the church. Ellis Rasmussen, who was fluent in Hebrew, Robert Patch, who was fluent in Greek, and Robert J. Matthews, an expert in the Joseph Smith translation, were called and asked to create a standardized concordance, dictionary, atlas, index, footnotes, ready references, and cross-references to other LDS scriptures. Daniel Ludlow and James Mortimer were also called as committee secretaries to assist as needed. With the necessary committee members in place, work began in early 1973. The thing we needed most was a method whereby they're cross-referenced. And then you can take a subject and you can find immediately what you look for in the Bible or the Doctrine of Covenants or the Book of Mormon, right in those three little columns at the bottom. You can study the subject in depth without fanning through an awful lot of sheets. The first area of concentration was to compile an extensive list of cross-references. With nearly 1,500 pages and over 24,000 verses, they soon realized that they could not complete this undertaking alone. 
In the fall of 1973, approval was given for BYU stakes to call returned missionaries to help research these references. We needed to point out uh, some of the potential there and then get them to read and, and make notes uh, that could be included as, as explanatory notes here and there. We give eight or ten pages to one of our workers and say, all right, now we'd like you to go through and check every footnote, see that they're correct and suitable for our purpose now. And if you have a better one added, those that are useless, just mark out. This process helped eliminate many erroneous references. However, it also added far more than were discarded. They discovered that on some topics, they had long lists of scriptures and that if they, if they were to include those in the printed text, why, uh, there'd be only two or three verses per page and the rest would be scriptural references. And so they began to develop what was called a subject index, thinking that uh, for very key items, they could uh, place all of those references in this so-called index and in the footnote re simply refer people to it. Another space-saving innovation was accomplished by adopting a new three-column footnote section along the bottom of each page. Because most references only require a third of a line or less, this accommodation resulted in the least possible white space per printed page. References, however, were not the only helps in these footnotes. Alternate words were added with an IE designation when an archaic word appeared in the Bible text. References to the subject index, or what became the topical guide, were added after a TG designation. References to the Bible dictionary were referenced as BD. Alternate translations of difficult Greek or Hebrew words were referenced as GR or HEB. By far most important is the spirit. But the Hebrew and the Greek sometimes do help. To have all of those notes at the bottom of the page, all the Heb and Gur, and the IE and BD and TG and JST, all those abbreviations. Uh, the, the whole purpose of this project, of course, is to help the saints understand the Bible, and we need that. That's our great connection with hundreds of millions of Christians and millions of Jews around the world. Another innovation was a unique approach to footnote numbering. The common practice was to number footnotes by chapter, beginning with the letter A and going through to the letter Z and then repeating the alphabet, starting with AA and so on. Now that works fine for most Bibles of the world, but in the LDS Bible, when you get to some chapters of Isaiah, you have many, you know, dozens of footnotes in one chapter. And so we had AA footnotes and BB footnotes. The designers were concerned that the repeated call-out letters were making the page appear unattractive. They suggested a cleaner page might be accomplished by removing many, if not all, of the footnotes but this would defeat much of the purpose of the publication. Ellis Rasmussen and Jim Mortimer continued to make it a matter of prayer as they made their final visit to the press. Then the idea came to make the footnotes verse-centric instead of chapter-centric and start the numbering over with each verse. Although this had never before been attempted in Bible publications, the decision felt right and the change was quickly implemented. Once back in Utah, however, they had to report their unauthorized change to the apostles on the scripture committee in an emergency meeting. I was watching every twitch of President Munson's jaw and so on as to what he was going to say. But before he had a chance to respond, Elder McConkie spoke and he said six words, pure inspiration, pure inspiration, pure inspiration. And that's how I feel about that whole project. Pure inspiration. Now, all those footnotes do is, is point you in the right direction, but they do point you in the right direction of a way to start to think about that particular verse and then to go, of course, deeper and deeper on your own study. Despite these innovations, footnote space still remained a premium. However, some explanations just required more space than others. If the part we wanted to include was longer than it would take eight lines, it would be placed in the back in the appendix. 
I had a student once at the Institute after the New Scriptures came out who said, you know, I've started to read in the Old Testament right from the very beginning. And after a number of months, I said, how far are you? And he said, oh, I'm only in chapter 6. I said, what's taking you so long? He said, I'm looking up all the scriptures, and it's a wonderful experience. Although thousands of hours were donated by hundreds of dedicated volunteers, these efforts alone would not have been enough to complete such a monumental project within the already extended time frame without the help of advancing technology. We would record in longhand uh, the footnotes we wanted to use on five by seven cards and restoring them in a shoebox. And we soon had several shoeboxes full of cards that was more than the human mind can keep track of. The emergence of computer technology made it possible to retrieve and organize data in a more efficient manner. The knowledge and skills of Stephen Howes were integral in helping the work to continuously move forward. There was one computer on campus was a whole house full. I remember that we had a bank of memory that was a whole megabyte and it was as big as a car. And nowadays, uh, you can put that on something you can't even see. Steve Hollis and others who worked there were very cooperative. They would give a huge discount, uh, probably 90% uh, savings if you'd do it uh, in the middle of the night. And that fit it right into my schedule, since I'm a lark anyway. We felt like the good Lord had blessed us with the, with the computer just at the, at the right moment. The computer proved to be a godsend in providing organization to the great quantity of information contained within the new publication. In correlation with the extensive cross-references, work began on a comprehensive index of topics and subject matter that would ultimately be known as the Topical Guide. Springing from a subject index of over 1,000 topics, the Topical Guide would be scaled down to 650 topics and then ultimately grow to a final number of nearly 750. And the Topical Guide, that is a, a work of genius in and of itself. Now we had men whom I think the Lord raised up to help. Ellis Rasmussen was one. Before the full utilization of computers, he, his mind was like a computer when it came to the scriptures. There were literally hundreds of teachers who were also doing this on the side, uh, checking scriptures and checking doctrinal uh, interpretations and everything. They uh, had a list of topics and uh, invited us to make any suggestions for additional topics. And uh, from that list then, we each were given assignments to uh, go and generate a, a list of pertinent scriptures for each, each of those topics. The collection was entered into the computer, one data card at a time. We got these uh, computer readouts, just hundreds of pages. It was too thick to hold in your hand so that one of the hardest decisions was how to pare it down and what to leave out. I went through the entire readout of the uh, Old and New Testaments a couple of times over all the scriptures to weed out some that really didn't uh, pertain very well. They'd come back and one of them would find something and that was a very uh, important uh, correcting and cleansing of the topical guide. Once the topical guide was in a manageable form, the committee thought it would be worthwhile to get feedback from the public. As a result, in 1977, Deseret Book published a preliminary version of the topical guide as a standalone scripture reference resource. They wanted those who were going to be using the book to uh, recognize its value. They wanted to uh, see if there were ideas out there in the church that nobody had brought up yet. They wanted to 
make sure that they didn't have any errors in there. And an invitation was given to members of the church to uh, give their input, suggestions, an address was provided where they could send that in. And uh, over a number of months, they began to gather a lot of these uh, suggestions. A new committee of 16 individuals was called to review the suggestions and to make appropriate recommendations of their own. Everyone on the committee felt that there was a great need for a concordance, something so that it wasn't just for study, but when you're trying to find a specific passage in the scriptures, you could do it fairly quickly, uh, which was really a different, although a related function. And so the proposal was that we combine the topical guide with a standard concordance so that it would meet both needs. Another thing was just because of the space that that would create that we do some formatting differently. Instead of having each entry on a separate line, uh, there'd be run on. The decision was also made to eliminate the separate 47-page index and incorporate it into the topics as well. Elder Packer came back, he said, okay, the brethren have approved this, now the next question is, who's gonna do this? <laughs> and so they called four of us to serve as a task group to work that process of taking the topical guide and turning it into a topical guide with concordance. They spent about three months spending their days there in an office together, going through it meticulously. One of the strengths of our, of our doctrine and our theology is that we have multiple voices teaching uh, the same principles in a consistent manner. A statement, say, in the Bible, there'll be a correlating statement, say, in the Old Book of Mormon that would tie in in a different place to a different people, but the same instruction. And it, it helps you to have a broader understanding of the, the particular principle that it is. Tens of thousands of possible references. If you follow them to, from left to right or top to bottom or across, right, no matter where you go with them, they're consistent. You don't, uh, you can't expose some major flaw by testing it in every direction. And that's incredible. I believe you study the scripture by subject as well as by chapter, by subject. And that was what the topical guide will do for you. It'll make every sermon broader. As the subject index was being created, it became evident that the Jesus Christ was a very central theme. I had an assignment on the task committee that uh, included doing certain parts of the topical guide that had to do with the Savior. And I wasn't quite prepared for what we found there. There is no subject in the topical guide m more extensively uh, cross-referenced than Jesus Christ. One of the first things I noticed when I got my first copy, my first set of this edition of the scriptures was uh, how far-reaching the uh, entries in the topical guide were about the Savior. Just unbelievable. Latter-day Saints should take the Bible very seriously because both the Old and New Testaments are Christ-centered centered texts. Both of them teach about Jesus Christ and His Gospel. They would find now in the topical guide 58 categories of information about Jesus Christ. 18 pages of small print, single-spaced, list literally thousands of scriptural references on the subject. These references from the four volumes of scripture constitute the most comprehensive compilation of scriptural information on the mission and teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ that has ever been assembled in the history of the world. There were so many topics on that subject that we began to develop them according to the subtopics. What do the scriptures say about him in the premortal existence? What do they say about his earthly ministry? Uh, what do they say about his atoning sacrifice? Everything just seemed to come together. And it wasn't, wasn't anything calculated because we weren't doing it that way. There has been more than one occasion where I've been on an airplane or somewhere else, somewhere else with someone who starts the old, well, you, you don't believe, well, I thought Mormons didn't believe in 
in Christ and you weren't Christians, and all you have to do is flip that open and say, well, let me show you something that you may find interesting. We want to come to know our Savior, Jesus Christ. And there it is, all laid out in that uh, topical guide all through the scriptures. Page after page after page, it bears its own testimony, if you will, because it becomes really clear that that the reason we have the scriptures are to testify of the Father and the Son. Do not mistake our reverent hesitation to speak glibly or too frequently of him to mean that we do not know him. He is no stranger to his saints, to his prophets and apostles now. He lives, he is our savior, our redeemer, our Lord. The basis of the LDS edition Bible Dictionary was the one being used in the missionary edition of the King James Bible, published by Cambridge University Press. Originally prepared by Protestant scholars, the Bible Dictionary within the new LDS edition would need to be broadened and revised to include many select LDS definitions and terms. Cambridge had a fairly good Bible Dictionary with the many things that had to be changed, but. They were willing and they gave us permission to use their Bible dictionary and then make whatever amendments we needed to make to us. I went through it day after day after day, removing anything that, um, uh, that we felt was not doctrinally consistent with the restoration of the gospel. For instance, um, in talking about the fall of Adam in that uh, Cambridge uh, Bible dictionary, uh, they indicated that that was a, a gross mistake in the, in the plan, that the plan of God went awry. And well, we couldn't settle for that. Also, in the um, uh, entry that they had on John the Revelator, or John the Beloved, as he's called, and they told about how he died near Ephesus about 100 A.D. And we know better than that from Latter-day Revelation. So I just crossed out everything that seemed to not be consistent with what we knew from Latter-day Revelation. There were other items that, uh, that are important to us that they didn't talk about. One is Aaronic priesthood, another is Melchizedek priesthood, the sign of the dove that was given to uh, John the Baptist by which he recognized Jesus. A number of things that are doctrinally important to us but were never mentioned in there. An integral part of the New Bible Dictionary was an expanded harmony of the events of Christ's life, not only those found in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but also those found in the Book of Mormon and other modern scripture. Another unique aspect of the LDS edition Bible was the inclusion of portions of Joseph Smith's inspired translation of the King James Bible. Never before had these passages been readily available to church members within the context of their own scriptures. The inspired version, of course, is a, an annotated um, version of the King James Bible that was corrected and expanded under the influence of, of the Spirit by Joseph Smith, Jr. The Lord had repeatedly commanded Joseph to publish this record, but after his death, the yet unpublished manuscripts remained in his wife Emma's possession. Some of our people had come west with their own handwritten copies of certain portions, but almost always they had the original draft. So when the reorganized church published what they called the inspired version, they published it from the finished draft. And so they said the reorganized church has changed it. What they hadn't realized was that the prophet made a, a first draft and then an edited draft. 
Because of that, there was a certain cloud or stigma resting on the uh, Joseph Smith translation, and so it got very little use in our church. Due to Brother Matthew's extensive research and that of Richard Howard of the Reorganized Church, the manuscript was seen to be true to the prophet's efforts. I was glad that I could be on hand to explore some of that with him because I particularly valued his thoroughness to detail. Bob Matthews was a fine scholar and, and he, he left no stone unturned to get at the reality that he was trying to research. With Elder Bruce R. McConkie's assistance, approval was obtained from the First Presidency to use portions of Joseph Smith's translation in the New Edition Bible. I made a list of all the references that we wished to use, and it's about 800 passages, and went to Missouri one time just on a regular trip and uh, showed it to Richard Howard and said, you know, we're making a new edition of the Bible, and yes, I've heard about that, he said, and we'd like to use uh, the text of these passages, and he said he would need to take it up with the, their first presidency. We were asking for cooperation and permission, as it were. The fellow at Herald House called and said, I've met with our first presidency, and they have given you permission to use this material, but there will be a fee. The fee that they want is one dollar. So I took a dollar out of my wallet, put it in an envelope and sent it to them. <laughs> and we were able to use the Joseph Smith translation material, which is, has been a great help in many ways. There are many, many members of the church that had never um, really noticed much of what the prophet Joseph did in his retranslation of some of the passages in the Bible until they were right there. Elder McConkie used to say to me in his um, plain spoken way, he'd say, Bob, we want a little less Bible dictionary and a little more JST. He said, don't use it all up on the dictionary. We want Joseph Smith in this Bible. He revised and added to the King James Version of the Bible by the spirit of inspiration doing more to perfect that holy volume of writ and to return it to its state of pristine perfection than any single person has ever done. Another important element of the new publication would be informative chapter headings. We looked for editions of the Bible that had chapter headings that would be helpful for an LDS student and would not be distracting and take them off in some doctrinal uh, thing that would be foreign to the, to the restored church. It was something of that sort, explaining these, those details that one member of the Twelve said, oh, Bruce can do that. The master, in putting many words into a small space and get readability, was Bruce McCaughey. And he was brilliant in the way he helped us on the, the lead-in. What's in this chapter, for example? What's in this section? He, he was terrific. They constitute uh, a marvelous commentary on, on what's coming. I won't be vain enough to say that nobody else could do it, but I will say this for sure, nobody else could uh, do it who had not paid the same price to prepare themselves to do it as he did. By the middle of 1977, James Mortimer, managing director of Deseret Book, began an earnest search for the perfect printer to publish a Bible unlike any the world had ever seen. We visited several locations. We talked to a number of people about doing the typesetting that would be involved. A massive amount of typesetting, as you might imagine. 
In June of 1977, James Mortimer and Ellis Rasmussen visited Cambridge University Press, the printers of some of the earliest editions of the King James Bible. Because we had uh, been working with Cambridge on the missionary and teacher's edition of the Bible that Cambridge published and produced for Deseret Book, we thought we might like to try to see what their capability might be. They have a, a specialty that's unique. They've done a lot more printing on that very, very genuine and yet uh, tender Bible print paper. And so uh, you're guaranteed a better job by someone who's worked on those presses for a long time. So Ellis Rasmussen and I made arrangements. We traveled to England. We went to Cambridge University Press. They were very gracious to us. When uh, Brother Mortimer got up and presented what our purpose was and what it was, how important it was, and what was needful, and it was just like bearing a testimony. And uh, when he got through, I thought, they know what this means. And there came to me at that point the witness that this is where we belonged. This is where the King James Bible had its roots in England, and they had been publishing it regularly since the year 1630. By the late 1970s, Cambridge University Press was one of the few remaining printers who still utilized the monotype compositor and caster. These tandem machines, with their series of complex arms and levers, molded individual letters out of hot lead on the spot. This was important because of the level of immediate adjustability that would be required during the printing process. As each line of text was entered, character spacing was adjusted automatically, while still retaining the character-by-character -character flexibility necessary to later insert the frequent footnote call-out letters. With so many study aids, it required over seven tons of hot metal type to set the LDS Bible. The compositors, the typeset, the keyboard operators, and the printers and the binders in, in, at CUP were probably the best in the world. They were, they were at the very peak of their 450 years of existence. This is where the, the genius of the typesetters and the layout people of Cambridge it was, was very important. They knew how to adjust the amount of text to meet the number of footnotes that we had. Every page, the cross-references from that page had to be on that very page. We couldn't go uh, to another page to carry on. Everything had to be page complete. I have no doubt that the Spirit of the, of the Lord did work with them and through them and helped them to help us. By January of 1978, Cambridge University Press began the process of typesetting on two monotype compositors, one working on the Old Testament and the other on the New. This new LDS Bible became the priority for nearly 20% of the Cambridge staff, and as a result, a project that would ordinarily take two and a half years to set was completed in just over a year and a half. Difficulty with it is printing on lightweight paper um, and maintaining the high standard. One of the things that ensured the quality of Bible printing at Cambridge is that we've always printed off a sheet. In preparing the manuscript for publication, Eleanor Knowles and Eric Bowen played significant editorial roles. Somebody had to be the final one that goes through and makes sure everything is perfect. The only way to do that is one word at a time, one comma at a time. Eleanor was our editor at Deseret Book, and she had the responsibility to do the, the proofreading and the the, the preparation of the materials to be sent for typesetting, and then to supervise the proofreading, and she was a very key individual. Eleanor will go down as one of the finest editors um, we've ever known in our culture in the dispensation. She was spectacular and very, very well suited. Derek Bowen was an old school editor. I use that term is that he belonged to a a period that was rapidly vanishing. In the course of the war, he lost his hearing. He never married, he lived alone in an apartment. But through the years with his employment at Cambridge, he had become an expert in the King James Bible. Cambridge made him available to us to uh, proofread, to uh, edit, to uh, watch over the, the work that was being done. 
the meticulous, uh, time-consuming, tiresome work that he did was uh, critical to what we were doing. And interestingly enough, about three months after we closed the book, he passed away. But his life was devoted to the coming forth of these scriptures. By August of 1979, the new LDS edition of the King James Bible was rolling off the presses. The final volume totaled 2,432 pages, which included the text of the Old and New Testaments, chapter headings, cross-references, and footnotes, as well as appendices including a topical guide, Bible dictionary, Joseph Smith translation, gazetteer, and the 24 color maps. After literally hundreds of thousands of hours volunteered by dedicated and faithful individuals, and nearly seven years from the time the committee first met, a truly remarkable Bible had come to fruition. A Bible that would be joined two years later by an equally remarkable triple publication of additional scripture containing the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. The triple was not even thought of at the beginning. But after we were well along with the Bible and saw the improvement in the footnote style, the format uh, as it's laid out on the page, and just the development that took place through the years, it was evident that we needed to have some consistency with all of our scriptures. It really fulfills a, an Old Testament prophecy that uh, refers to the stick of Joseph and the stick of Judah. Take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all of the house of Israel, his companions, and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. It was a miracle to the Cambridge people to see how we could take three other books of our scripture and they just fit hand in glove with the Old Testament and the New Testament. To fully comprehend the Book of Mormon, we have to understand the Old Testament. To fully comprehend the Old Testament and the New Testament, we have to understand the Book of Mormon. Those Old Testament verses, two of them, show ten footnotes. One of the ten leads us to the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ, where half a world away, Lehi, prophet of Ephraim, wrote, Wherefore, the fruit of thy loins shall write, and the fruit of the loins of Judah shall write, that which shall be written by the fruit of thy loins, and also that which shall be written by the fruit of the loins of Judah shall grow together. Now one footnote may seem a flimsy thread to tie the two together, but five of the ten footnotes lead us to headings in the topical guide, where 611 other references broaden our knowledge of this one subject and speak as voices from the dust. They are indeed one in our hands, Ezekiel's prophecy now stands fulfilled. After so much work, the publication that rolled off the press was impressive by any standard. The National Bible Organization uh, issued the church a, uh, an award recognizing the church's interest in the Bible. This citation of appreciation, which is presented to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is an appreciation of outstanding service to the Bible cause through the publication of its own edition of the King James Version, thereby greatly enhancing the study of the Bible by its membership. It did cause quite a, a, an impact. 
and particularly this Bible actually looked very nice as well. All too often, uh, Bibles are not attractive visually or typographically. This one did indeed look good, and um, it, it upheld every, every one of the best virtues of good typography. There was no other printer who could print and typeset in the way CUP did. The style of type, we haven't even talked about that, but one of the contributions of uh, President um, Monson to, to this committee was the selection of a style of type that's easier to read and would take less space. So you get more on a page without looking crowded. Not long after its initial English printing, plans were put into motion to bring this unique Bible and its comprehensive study aids to people of other languages. An assignment was given to see if they could translate the topical guide into Spanish. That didn't work very well. In fact, they expended a number of years trying that. The differences of vocabulary and the nuances of the meanings of the words just didn't come across. It is not just a technical undertaking to translate uh, the scriptures. It's important that uh, the spirit be there, that the meaning be there, that the intent of the, of the spirit be reflected in the translation in every, in every language. A separate project was originated for these foreign speakers based on the topical guide where they would uh, capsulize the key elements by subject. They began the process of consolidating or making a synopsis of taking the 1,200 pages of the topical guide and the uh, Bible dictionary, and then make a synopsis of only 250 pages. So they had to be very carefully in selecting the most essential topics and the most important scriptures that reference those topics. The resulting reference volume, A Guide to the Scriptures, has since been translated into 37 languages and has been included in all subsequent language publications of LDS scriptures. It was received with great gratitude by the members. It just brought a, a new light into the, into the scriptures. I remember how excited I was. I could, I read all of it in one night. I was so excited and just marking scriptures and, and saying, oh, I could prepare a talk by just reading this on grace or on the atonement. With this foundational work in place, the challenge of adding the detailed cross-references and chapter headings to the Bible was undertaken in various languages. In 2009, the LDS Spanish Bible, or Santa Biblia, became the first such published volume. It was based upon the Reina Valera Spanish edition of 1909 with limited modifications to correct spellings, update extremely archaic terms and grammar, and to eliminate regionalizations. They had to reconcile the words for the whole Spanish-speaking world. The genius of it all was to involve many Spanish-speaking um, members from very many countries where the church was. They had to come to an agreement on, to determine which words would be not only appropriate, but also understandable to all. We're bent on continuing that process and making sure that every person can have the scriptures, including the Book of Mormon, in their own tongue, in their own language, so they can truly understand. <clears throat> and uh, have the, the blessing of that uh, access, if you will, to the mind and will of the Lord and to His revelation. I don't remember having my own scriptures growing up. I don't remember a great deal of scripture study in my home until you got to those new scriptures and uh, and then uh, coinciding president kimball says okay we now want everyone to have their own scriptures and we want everyone to read at least 15 minutes a day so my recollection as a youth is that that was a turning point 
not only in the church, but in my personal life and my family's life, that the scriptures truly became part of our daily life. By using the footnotes and the cross-references, it helps us to uh, see how each testament testifies of Jesus Christ and relates to each other. We can't uh, uh, have a, a fullness without each of the works of Scripture. By reading the Scriptures, I, I'm able to, to come to a, you know, a better understanding of, of who I, I am, uh, despite all these, these other events that, uh, that take place out here. It's, it's a feeling that, that is hard to replicate. And I found that in reading the Scriptures, it, it, it puts me in this sort of uh, feeling, this, this own world in a sense. And uh, it allows me to, to be there for as long as I'm, I'm reading them. I don't know where I'd be without the scriptures. The scriptures um, are my lifeline. They are what gets me through hard days. I, I wonder about people who don't have this holy wor the holy words of Christ and don't have scriptures and don't have this knowledge of who Christ is and who they are. How do they get through the hard times? I know they can't get through it with as much peace or as much security as if you have that knowledge and have those scriptures with you. No matter what goes on around here in terms of turmoil and economic downturn and, and the troubles of day-to-day -day life, the scriptures being a piece that in the end, and all of these prophets over time have testified that in the end, the Savior and His kingdom and those that follow Him and take upon His name will prevail. I love to read, and yet I don't have the same feelings for my books as I do my scriptures as I read them. I feel so guided, and the times when I do skip out on my readings or, or um, I'm too tired and I don't think I'm going to be able to read my scriptures, it just feels like something's missing. I believe we have a stronger generation than we've had ever before, in large measure because they've had ready and constant access to the scriptures. More people have studied the scripture, more people have carried the scriptures, and more people have been taught the scriptures and understand the scriptures as a result of the work we're talking about. Regular personal scripture study strengthens faith and testimony because you get to know God, understand the doctrine, receive revelation, and feel the desire to be more obedient to the commandments. We have a greater need than people at any other time in the world's history to have that constant and immediate access to the scriptures. To have the chance to have a copy, to carry it with you, to have access at will this is really the first time in the history of the world that we've been able to turn to them instantly at our convenience at any moment and, and carry a copy with us. This is the day of which Joseph Smith said, God hath not revealed anything to Joseph, but what he will make known unto the twelve. And even the least saint may know all things as fast as he is able to bear them. Nephi saw in vision the work of the latter days when he wrote, And blessed are they who shall seek to bring forth my Zion at that day, for they shall have the gift and the power of the Holy Ghost. And whoso shall publish peace, yea, great tidings of great joy, how beautiful upon the mountains shall they be. Throughout the course of history, there have been many who have sought, struggled, and sacrificed to bring forth truth and the Word of God to all of God's children. Today, under the inspired direction of the prophets and apostles of Jesus Christ, that vision has been realized. These magnificent books of Scripture are before us, woven as threads to create an illuminating tapestry of light and truth. Divine technology, consecrated talent, extensive toil, and just the right timing combined to bring forth a work that would enable faith to increase, enhance gospel scholarship, and better prepare every man to speak in the name of God, the Lord. We have to earn what we get spiritually. And the scriptures are a guide to make it that much easier, but we still have to earn our knowledge and testimony. You have to put yourself in a condition to have that spirit, to, uh, 
to receive what the Lord is willing to give. Sometimes uh, it may take a, a good deal of pondering and prayer in addition to study to make that happen. If all the Latter-day Saints lived as they should, then Moses' petition would be granted, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. This is the promised day when God shall give unto us knowledge by his Holy Spirit. I bear my own witness that he, he does speak. <clears throat> the spirit does come to those who seek hunger and thirst after it, but it comes in his way and his time.